Uh, Matthew says it like this. He, he says, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Mark says, very early on the first day of the week. John says, uh, I'm sorry, Luke says, on the first day of the week at early dawn. And then John says, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. These words set the scene uh, for the discovery that was going to be made that Jesus, this man uh, who claimed to be the Son of God, uh, was no longer in the tomb. These words are how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John begin their accounts of telling us how uh, the discovery was about to be made. This is the scene that was set before this discovery, uh, this empty tomb discovery, was going to be made. This man claimed to be God. This man claimed to perform miracles. In fact, it was more than a claim. He just did them. People saw them. He did miracles. It was a, it was a fact. He taught with authority, unlike any of the religious leaders, so-called religious leaders of the day. He said that he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up again. And he delivered on that promise. He, of course, was speaking of his own body when he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He delivered on that promise. The temple was destroyed, his body, and then raised up again on the third day. He raised it up by his own power. Before his death, Jesus taught that no one had the authority to take his life from him, but that he would do that on his own initiative. He would lay that life down on his own initiative. He said he had the authority to lay down his life, and he had the authority to take it back up again. He delivered on that promise as well. He laid down his life, and he raised it back up again. The Jews desperately wanted Jesus dead. He was a threat to their power, a threat to their authority, a threat to politics, a threat to everything, the system that they had created and that they had benefited from. He was a threat. That's how the Jews felt. Now, the, the Romans were involved, of course, but for them it was more of a the Jews were causing trouble again. The Jews were just creating a lot of drama again. And the Romans kind of wanted to squash the drama and, you know, just shut all this up. And so they kind of played a role in that regard. They just wanted things to be uh, hushed down a little bit, keep the peace, so to speak. But when it became apparent that Jesus had indeed risen from the grave as uh, he had prophesied he would and as his uh, disciples uh, had some understanding of, um, of course, there's some, you know, we, we kind of wonder, what did they know, what didn't they know? Because they, they seem to flee and get a little depressed for a while. But um, as soon as it becomes apparent that he did raise from the dead, the Jews got desperate. And in their desperation, they kind of sort of proved the validity of the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. They proved in their desperation for generations to come the truth that Jesus did, in fact, raised from the dead. Hear me out. In Matthew's gospel, we read about how the Jewish leaders paid off the, uh, the guards who guarded uh, Jesus' tomb, paid them to tell a particular story, and that story uh, went a little something like this. We all fell asleep, and the disciples came and stole the body. Re really? Really, we've got all this unrest. The Jews and the Romans are having to work together on this. The Jewish leadership and the Roman leadership having to work together on this because this guy is, you know, turning the world upside down here. We got all kinds of issues uh, from this Jesus character. He's got a big following. Uh, people are claiming he's going to raise from the dead. The Jews are uh, in bed with the Romans, basically, to try to make sure that this Jesus doesn't get any more power. We just want him dead. We don't care if we have to do it illegally. He needs to be dead. We're going to put guards at the tomb to make sure that. That he doesn't do any kind of tricks or his disciples don't do any kind of tricks we all fell asleep I mean have you ever had something really important that you needed to do and you just fell asleep now some of you I know you're fully capable of doing that <laughs> but an entire paid guard in a situation like this they all fell asleep I have a hard time believing but that's not even, that's not even the, 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 the proof. That's not even the proof, guys. That's just silliness is what it is. But that's a story. They were all sleeping, and, and they were supposed to say that 
the, the, the uh, disciples of Jesus came and stole the body. But here's what we actually definitely have and can hold on to here. What we have is the enemies of Christianity guarding the tomb that they knew contained Jesus' body. They wouldn't be standing there guarding it if they didn't. Here they are guarding this tomb, enemies of Christianity, and then admitting that the tomb was empty on Sunday. Now, not only that, but Matthew claims, well, Matthew doesn't just claim, he says, he writes it in his, his gospel, that this story, this, the disciples came and stole the body when we were all asleep. This story is being circulated widely among the Jews, has been, and still is to this day. Now, when he says to this day, he's talking about the time when he was writing this, of course, right? The, the, the contemporaries. He says it's still being circulated widely to this day. Now, what has Matthew done? He's opened himself up on purpose. To someone who's alive at that day, someone who was involved, someone who was there, or someone who's just, it doesn't even matter if they were there or a witness, just alive today. If you're alive today, you could say, well, I've never heard that story. That's not the way it happened. Or I was there. None of that happened. That's a lie. But nobody said anything like that. Nobody did anything like that because they couldn't. It wasn't true. Now, no one seems to be peddling the idea that the tomb wasn't empty, but let's say the tomb wasn't empty. What would we expect? If the tomb wasn't empty, we would, of course, expect a parade with Jesus' body being the feature, um, I don't know if you want to call it a, uh, you know, like a float or if they could get him up in the air like Macy's Thanksgiving Day. I don't know. But they would take his dead body and show it to the whole city, right? But they didn't because they couldn't. Now, there's plenty of other facts to consider, to weigh, you know, the, the evidence here. But ultimately, if we study and we consider the evidence like we would for any other historic fact, George Washington, you know, crossing this river or that river, or any other historic fact, if we would weigh the claims and weigh the evidence and study these things in that same way, we would find that it seems that the disciples of Jesus had this bulletproof story, this airtight story. I mean, like I said, Matthew even challenges it, opens himself up, saying, say I'm wrong. Just say I'm wrong. And on the flip side, what we find is that it seems that the opposition to Jesus, they're desperate. They're grasping. We know they were corrupt. We know they were extremely dishonest. They were notorious for their dishonesty. And the list goes on and on and on. These are not people that you trust and you believe and yet somehow we, we sit here and we try to, you know, split hairs and try to figure out, well, you know, that resurrection thing seems pretty far-fetched. No, it really doesn't. See, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus may not be what you grew up thinking it was. And what I mean by that is it's not necessarily uh, just something that we hope is true. You know, I don't have the wooden podium up here anymore. Here we go. It's not something we have to knock on wood about. It's not something we have to hope is true or something that we would just like to be true. In fact, it's not even something that we're scared to investigate or even nervous to investigate it. And we're pretty confident about investigating it because the logical evidence doesn't just lead us to believe that, no, it is possible. No, it actually leads us to the understanding that it's more than just possible. It is likely. It is the logical, reasonable conclusion when you look at all the evidence. And we have not looked at all the evidence this morning, and we will not look at all the evidence. Now, we can, if you're willing to sit down for a little while, we can. But uh, in, a, in a sermon, we can't do all that right now. But what I'd like to spend the remainder uh, of my time discussing is this. Why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus go through the death, burial, and resurrection? Why, why did all this... Happen. I'd like to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And this verse could accurately be described as the gospel in a nutshell. At least that's what I like to call it. Uh, it may only be one verse, but it provides us a complete outline of the power and the purpose of the gospel. The, the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So let's read through this single verse here real quick and then... We'll take a look at the individual parts. 
So scripture says here, it says, he made, now that is God, okay? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the gospel in a nutshell, right? The, the good news in a nutshell. One verse tells it all here. I said we're going to look at the power and the purpose of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So let's look first at the portion of this verse or the portions of this verse that tell us about the power, okay? Uh, the first part that I want to cover is just two words. He made, all right? He made. Here's the source of the power. He made means God made, okay? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, right? So there's the source of the power. God, right? This was God's idea. God was the one behind all of this. Jesus said, right, John 3, 16, we all know it, right? For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He did this. God did this in order to save us so that uh, we wouldn't perish, so that we could experience eternal life. God is behind all this. God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son so that we could experience eternal life and, and escape the wrath that we deserve. This plan, of course, required God in the flesh. God the Son. One part of the Godhead to, to be an innocent victim on our behalf, right? This is the one who would die for us because of what we did. This was God's idea. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, and this is a hard passage for me to read. It says, the Lord was pleased to crush him. The Lord was pleased to crush him. But we know why. For the greater good. For the greater good, God was willing to do this. For the ultimate purpose of providing salvation to us, the Lord was pleased to crush him. Again, this was God's plan. He's the source. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. All right Now, the next part of the power behind the gospel is the fact that God made him who knew no sin. See that next part there? Him who knew no sin. Who is him who knew no sin? That's not very good English, is it? Not very good grammar. Who is that? Jesus, right? Who, who else could be sinless? Who else knew no sin that walked this earth? Well, that's Jesus, of course. Jesus, God the Son, obviously played a pretty critical role in the gospel story. The good news, the, the death, burial, and resurrection, that was Jesus, right? It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He, of course, was the one who came to earth in human form and hung on the cross for us. But the important fact that, that, that I want us to see here, the, for, the important fact that this is pointing out here, obviously, is that Jesus knew no sin. We know the role he played, but I want to talk about the fact that he knew no sin. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 here. This verse, Peter writes, he says that Jesus was he who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Hebrews chapter 4 Verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And then Hebrews 7.26 says, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And then one more passage here, 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So, Scripture makes it really clear that Jesus is without sin. Jesus is sinless. But, but what's important about that? Why is that important? What's the power behind this fact? Well, when God gave the law of Moses... He required sacrifices to be made. Animals, of course, were what we're talking about at that time. Animals were being sacrificed. Those animals couldn't pay the price for sin, uh, obviously, but they were this vivid reminder that sin brings death. Sin requires the death of an innocent victim. Because of sin, that has to happen, and God was teaching them that through the law. That was all a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do. It wasn't that you die and a goat needs to, or you sin and a goat needs to die. You know, that's preposterous. But it was this idea, just getting it ingrained in God's people's mind at that time, getting it ingrained in their mind that you sin 
and there's death as a result. Because that's what happened when sin entered the world with Adam and Eve, right? They sinned, death came into the world. The world started uh, rotting and decaying, death came into the world. So God is just teaching them here through the law of Moses that sin brings death. At that time, like I said, it was just a, an animal. But just as interesting as all these other facts are is the fact that God required that animal to be um, quote-unquote perfect, uh, without blemish. It couldn't be lame, couldn't be uh, diseased or anything like that. Every aspect, though, of these animal sacrifices, like I said, was a foreshadowing of the greater final sacrifice that was to come. Jesus, of course, right? Think about Jesus and, and his relationship uh, to what God was teaching through these sacrifices of old. He was a sacrifice for sin. He was an innocent victim. He was without sin, right? He was him who knew no sin. He was a perfect subject. He was unblemished by the guilt of sin. After all the foreshadowing of the animal sacrifices under the law of Moses, we should expect nothing less from the final perfect sacrifice. That he would also be uh, perfect in this way. But Jesus also had to be perfect in order to take away the old law and to usher in the new covenant, the new covenant of grace. And Jesus once said, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, he said. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, verses, uh, verse 14, he says, Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, that's the old law uh, in a nutshell, which was hostile to us, right? It was a ministry of death. It just showed us everything that was wrong. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. See, Jesus kept the law perfectly. He knew no sin as our text says. And because he didn't sin, because he was sinless, uh, completely clean from any guilt that sin would bring on him, he was qualified and the only one who could be qualified to take the law out of the way and nailing it to the cross in the way that he did. The only one who could do that. This is the power of Jesus being him who knew no sin. Now we continue on. In our text here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. This is critical. To be sin on our behalf. Jesus became the object of God's wrath. Not because of anything Jesus did, though, right? It's because of what we did. Because of our sin. This was prophesied back in Isaiah 700, about 700 years before Jesus even came on the scene uh, to, to earth in the flesh anyway. 700 years or so earlier in Isaiah chapter 53 uh, verses 5 and 6, the scripture says, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. Listen, this is written 700 years before Jesus even came on the scene. Before the Romans were here and crucified the people. The scripture says he was pierced through. Why? For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all. Fall on who? Not us. Him. You see, centuries before Christ came to earth in the flesh, Jesus was, uh, or, I'm sorry, Isaiah was prophesying that this punishment, that there was going to be one who would come to take the punishment that we deserve for us. In the New Testament, Peter puts it this way, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He says, And he himself bore our sins in his body, on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed it's not fair he didn't deserve it we deserved it it's not fair but it's exactly what happened Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear so it's our sin, it's our iniquity, it's our, our disobedience that created this problem, that created this separation between us and our God. But it was Jesus who bridged the gap. 
Jesus, who made the way for us to be reconciled to God the Father again. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says that there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. See, Jesus was this go-between that we desperately needed. We couldn't bridge the gap back to God. We created that separation by sinning. Our iniquities, our transgressions, created that separation between us and him. We couldn't claw our way back. We couldn't build a bridge that would go over that chasm that our sin created. But Jesus could. Jesus could be sinless and perfect, and he could do that. It's not fair. We deserve the wages of sin. We deserve to be eternally separated from the Lord. But God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. We created this sin debt that we couldn't repay. And as the song says, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. So that's the power. Now let's talk about the purpose. The purpose of the good news. The purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the death, burial, and resurrection. The last part of this verse is where we find the purpose. Or we might call it the goal. The goal of the gospel. Right? It says, so that... We might become the righteousness of God. Okay, There's where the purpose comes into play. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the reason for God's plan. This is the goal of the good news. This is God's purpose for enacting this plan that we call the gospel so that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, what's the righteousness of God? What is the right? I mean, we know God is righteous, but what does this mean? He wants us to become the righteousness of God. Well, that's God's righteousness. We can't become, I mean, that's his, right? It's not what this is exactly. Sometimes I wonder, why doesn't this say, so that we might have our sins washed away? Why doesn't this passage say, so that we might have eternal life? Then it would be really easy to understand, right? Well, if we read the New Testament uh, just a little bit, we actually find that the righteousness of God is synonymous with salvation. It does have to do with uh, salvation. You see, the righteousness of God is this righteousness that God possesses and is able to give to whomever he chooses. It's like you have forgiveness that you can give or not give. And in that way, it's yours to give. It's the forgiveness of Jake to give or not give. Well, God has this righteousness to give. He can apply righteousness. He can credit righteousness to your account because you're not righteous. I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. We just are. No, there is none. Not one. Only God and God alone is righteous. But God can credit you. He can consider you righteous under the new covenant. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become what God considers Righteous. We want to be considered righteous in the mind of God. And God wants us to be righteous. He wants to consider us righteous. Check out a few passages with me here. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in what? The gospel. In it, the righteousness of God, there's that term, is revealed. From faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. So Paul shows us here that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, right? And in that gospel, he says, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And he even goes on to quote, he says, the righteous man shall live by faith. So see, the gospel story reveals for us how to be considered righteous in the mind of God. It shares that with us. It shows us that. It tells us that. God considers us righteous based on our demonstrated faith. we got to have faith, and it can't just be a, I have faith. You can't just declare it. You have to live it. The righteous man shall live by faith. You're not saved by works. You're saved by faith. But you don't have faith if you don't have works. Right? It's not real faith if you don't do anything about it. You can't say you love your kids and just neglect them all day long, right? You love your kids by showing them that, right? Well, because you love them, you show them, right? Because you have faith in God, you do good works. God considers us righteous 
when we demonstrate our faith, when we live by faith. Look at Romans chapter 3 now. Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Scripture says, even the righteousness of God, there's that phrase again, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, there's no distinction, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace to the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now verse 22 tells us exactly what Paul just said in uh, chapter 1 verses uh, 16 and 17, right? He just said that a second ago. The righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We got that. But look at verses 23 and 24 here. It says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's not that we are righteous, as I said before. It's not that we are righteous. It's that God wants to consider us righteous. It's his gift to give or not. That's why it's called the righteousness of God. He can give it or not. But he's made a promise under certain conditions where he promises that he will. Now, there are several other passages that I'd love to go through uh, with you because I'd love for you to see just the, the, the many instances where this righteousness of God shows up in the scriptures and is equated to salvation. But to save a little time, let's look at one more here. Romans chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. We'll look at this real quick before we move on to... I kid you not, the last two words of this scripture here, all right? Romans chapter 5, verse 17 through 19 says, For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so the, through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. See, Adam's sin back in the Garden of Eden brought death into the world. God told Adam, that they could eat of every tree. I mean, what a great permission. You can eat of every tree in this beautiful garden that was created by me in, you know, just pure perfection. You can eat of any tree. Now, there wasn't prohibition, just one. Okay, the permission was any tree. The prohibition was that one tree, right? You can't eat of that one tree. And there was a punishment announced. If you do, you'll surely die. So the warning was, was out there that it was going to happen. You, you would surely die if you eat of that tree. Death would enter the world and you would experience it. That's exactly what happened. When they disobeyed God, that's exactly what happened. We've now inherited the, the cursed world, right? We've not inherited Adam's sin, but we've inherited a world that is affected by his sin. We know what it looks like, right? We're very familiar with it. Little by little, bit by bit, now everything disintegrates. Everything that's spinning in space, slowing down. Everything that's burning big is burning down. Everything that was alive at one time is decaying. It's rotting. It's dying. Death came into the world with sin. My two favorite words. But God. But God made a way of escape. This all came into the world, nasty, terrible, uh, we seem without hope, but God made a way of escape. Adam's sin brought death. Jesus' righteousness brings life. That's what this passage in Romans 5 is saying. Through one sin that Adam committed, we all suffer the condemnation of death and separation. But through the righteousness and the obedience of Christ, many will be made righteous and will receive abundant grace and eternal life. But how? how? How's that going to happen? Just because Jesus went up on the cross? How's that going to happen? We've already read the answer. And uh, we've already talked about it. I mentioned it even in passing. How do we become the righteousness of God here? What does our text say? Look again. Look again at our verse here. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In him. Who's in him? Well, that's Jesus, right? And we've discussed the power of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we said that the purpose is so that we might become the righteousness of God. But we won't be part of the many who are made righteous unless we're in him. Unless we're in Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 up here. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, 
you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And now look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. This is Paul writing. He says, So that they may also obtain the salvation, which is in Christ Jesus and with it, eternal glory. So it's clear that the purpose of God's good news is, is um, only realized in the lives of those who are in Christ. There's no universalism where Jesus died and so everybody's going to be saved. We're all just playing a church game right now, but all those people out in the world, they're going to be fine. What would be the point in telling them about the good news? We'd just be playing a game, right? Not everybody's going to be Save. If you're outside of Christ, you won't be saved. You've got to be in Christ. you be in Him. So how do we become in Him? How do we get there? Well, Romans chapter 6. I love these verses. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 say this. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus... Did somebody just get into Jesus there? Did you hear it? Let me actually hear you say it. Did you hear it? Yes. Did you? Yeah. So I asked the question, how do you get in him? And I just read a verse that says, people got into Christ Jesus. So I think this is our answer. Let's keep reading. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father... So we too might walk in newness of life. There's how you get into him. Right there. We've already learned and we know that faith is foundational. You wouldn't get into him if you didn't have faith in him. It wouldn't happen. You wouldn't have the desire. Nor would it even be possible for you to get into him without faith. But here in Romans chapter 6, Paul is reminding Christians. This, this book, Romans, was written to Christians so what we have here is him reminding Christians how they got into Christ. So what can we learn from it? How to get into Christ. How to get into Christ, right? And what does he say here? At our baptism, we are baptized into his death. That's the first part of the gospel, right? The fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose from the grave three days later according to the scriptures, death, burial, and resurrection, says we're baptized into his death. Not just our own death, into his death. That's getting into Christ. It says that our baptism, we're buried with him. That's the second part of the gospel. Christ was buried in that tomb, right? Remember the soldiers guarded it and then fell asleep? And at our baptism, we were raised to walk in newness of life. As Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. That's getting into Christ. It's going through the death, burial, and resurrection with him. Down into the water, up out of the water in full faith. Death, burial, resurrection. If you believe that he, that is God, made him who knew no sin, that is Jesus, to be sin on your behalf, so that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ, then let me invite you to come. Come in full faith in the gospel, full belief and faith in the gospel, full faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Come repenting of your sins and confessing your belief that, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of the living God. And be baptized into him. Become in him. Be baptized into him, into his death, into his burial, into his resurrection. Let's pray. Father,